so welcome and thanks for coming so early in the morning. I really, uh, really appreciate uh, coming out. Um, so this is the first workshop on biological consistent vision. And as one of the organizers, um, one of the things that we thought would be interested to do would be to really make some connection with biology. So um, I, I work at the Royal Institute of Harvard, um, and my lab sort of has a foot in both worlds. So we have a biology lab, so we have grads in physiology. And at the same time, we do computer vision research. So uh, I sort of volunteer to do you a know, crash course on what the biology teach computer vision research and biological research. And the title of the program is What Does It Mean for Biology Consistent? But uh, the real title of the is going to arrive at the course of things is 10 Things About Neuroscience That Every Computer Vision Research Should Know. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the idea here is to, to talk about things from neuroscience that are sort of your foundational importance, the important biology of the vision. They're not obvious to the field outsider. So if you're reading uh, literature and you're not from neuroscience, a lot of things aren't clear. So part of the goal here is to, to make some of those things more obvious, or at least to give pointers to where the dragons are. Um, and then also to, to pay some attention to areas where biology is potentially out of sync with the current new vision approaches. And there's interesting insights that so why would we care about biology at all? Why are we having this, this workshop? Uh, the, the traditional counter-argument is something like, uh, well, we have planes, and, and we, we built planes. We didn't really have to study birds to make planes. You know, we, didn't, we don't have planes that have their wings. Uh, so people often have to criticize biological as part of computation by saying, well, you know, we really don't need this. We just forward it. Um, and, and, and that's a fair point to an extent. So the idea is that computers So, um, there, there's some truth in that analogy, but I think actually the, the conclusion is a little bit wrong. And if you look at birds, in particular, you know, this pigeon, it's sort of like a, a feral chicken that lives in the city, um, it can do things that aeronautical engineers just would dream about doing. So, it can get off the ground in a fraction of a second, a single clap of its wings, and it can land on a dime. Uh, these are things that modern planes just can't do. Um, meanwhile, they can fly, they can go to a full stall on the left, to a full stall on the right, about two seconds. Uh, these are things that can crash. So, um, and then on the other hand, you have know, birds like albatrosses that can use almost no energy and dynamically soar by reading about the air currents of the planets. So, in some sense, I think this is a, a true analogy of the conclusion is wrong. Computers are the equivalent of planes. They can work in very narrow regimes and they can far out from humans. So, humans aren't able to do arithmetic uh, anywhere near as well as computers can. So, in some sense, computers are the planes of, of the computation world. But we don't, we aren't able to do a lot of things birds can do it. And, and biology is part of vision, really, is trying to study uh, biological systems to, to try and get those abilities. And it's sort of interesting that, that even just the last five years, uh, people have really started studying birds again, particularly from our micro uh, air vehicles. Um, so we're really trying to use sort of dynamic uh, vortices and all these things. So, so biology is, biological inspiration is really making a resurgence. And the, the point here is to, to take that to vision. So the other reason to, to really pay attention to vision is that uh, biological vision is that biological vision is really the best thing to get to. So here's the label phases of the wild challenge. This is a, a standard computer vision test set for face recognition. And this is just off their website. This is a series of RMC curves. And the one thing I'd like to point out is those three curves at the top, those are humans. And actually, the, the, the bottom curve, the, the lowest one, is actually humans where they actually crop out the face of the So um, humans are just radically better at doing vision than any current computer vision systems. So, the idea that neuroscience gives us the ability to study that system. It's really reverse engineering exercise. So if you had a, a, an electronic system that you wanted to understand, you would open it up and see how it works. Put a, put a logic program and figure, try and figure out how the system is working. And that's the same idea with neuroscience. So this is a picture of a microelectrode uh, next to a neuron. And it's, it's exactly analogous. When you're going there, open up the box and try and see how this thing works. So without further ado then, uh, starting on the tip. So, I've organized this in three themes, and I'm going to go through one by one, and we'll see how it goes. So, uh, the first theme is that real biology is far more complex than many lab inspired models. Uh, so, the first point I'd like to make is that hierarchical organization is pervasive. So, what we have here is a uh, picture, so this is in the human medicine picture of a cat brain, a monkey. And 
the visual cortex is organized into the bridge of the eye, goes through a nucleus of thalamus, and then goes back to the back of the brain, B1, and then goes through successive processing stages of B1, B2, B4, and B2. And this is true in all mammals that, that have uh, visual systems. And it's really interesting to look at this hierarchy and, and understand it, because it gives us a lot of clues to what we can do with biology. So if we look at B1, which is the first cortical stage uh, of vision, uh, the ventral screen, which is a it's involved in form perception, um, we see that it has uh, something like four wavelet uh, response curves. And then if you, if you, so basically it's responding to orientation in scales um, in the visual image. And then you can see that this is a color plot showing the orientation tuning of a B1 neuron. So that, the fact that it's sort of the star plot is sort of like that. Orientation and the one at the bottom is the neuron with the It's not as well as the orientation. So you find a diversity of these things. And then uh, in B1, uh, the important point is that the receptive fields are very small. So this is a very high resolution uh, of the world. Now it's half degree of visual angle. A visual angle is a, a method that most computer vision people are. A lot of computer vision people aren't familiar with, but basically, what it allows is if you hold your, your thumb out at arm's length, uh, the, the angle of the, of that tends to your thighs about two degrees. So, a V1 receptive field is about a quarter of that. And politicians are, are very, they, they like to demonstrate this really fun. And then, as we progress through the hierarchy, uh, which things happen. So, as we look at V1 to V2, uh, signals are forwarded to V2, V4, T, a couple things happen. The receptive fields get bigger, so cells are responding to larger and larger regions of space. They're responding to more and more complex stimuli. And the more tolerant to variation, variation of position, variation of lighting, all those things uh, become more tolerant. Uh, so when biology gets to IT, which is the final stage, uh, the receptive field is about 20 degrees, so about like that. that. That's probably too much. <laughs> points for enthusiasm. Um, and then more interesting, uh, the, recept the, the actual stimuli that responds to are quite a common one. So uh, this is a, a response from an IT around a monkey, and in 1984 they showed, uh, as and all showed uh, pictures of Attacked monkey faces and scrambled monkey faces and found that the cells were, were very selective with monkey, the, the attack of monkey face. Uh, and then importantly, uh, you know, in 1995 showed that if you take a stimulus, in this case that's sort of red slice of the thing, and you move it around the visual field, the cell will respond to the selective way irrespective of position. So this is a very important property of the monkey that we change. And in fact, if you quantify that, if you take these IT neuron responses and treat them like a feature descriptor, so that's something that everyone here is familiar with, um, we actually do really well. In on uh, one uh, version of the picture, you can automatically generalize across points as position tolerance and scale tolerance property uh, that's been built in the hierarchy. So, uh, so that's great, and we now have sort of a blueprint for what biology inspired vision systems should look like. Uh, the problem is that um, most, a uh, large fraction of biology inspired vision systems pretty much stop at one, and the large fraction of traditional computer vision stuff uh, basically is doing a one step operation. So, Built uh, a model that we've, we've dubbed V1 like, which is a very simple uh, sort of caricature of what happens in V1. And we found that actually this, this system was very effective at a wide variety of tasks. So uh, at the time when we did it in 2008, uh, V1 like, which is just a model of V1, the very first layer of cortical uh, processing, uh, we actually had some of the art numbers in Calvin 1. Uh, since then, things have gotten a little bit better, but it's still competitive. Uh, and then we went through a bunch of different face recognition sets, which are our big ones. That are still in use. We found that we have uh, you know, state of the art reports there as well. So um, that's great because it, it shows that, you know, that there's, it's good for biological vision so far as people like it's biological, but really it, it's, it's more signals that there's a problem because if, if the whole show is all in this very first layer, um, what's the rest of the, that stuff for? And in fact, you can show that it's not so much uh, something that's great about V1, but it's actually a problem in data sense. So, as a whole, in biological vision, we really need to be pushing towards deeper layers, understanding what these deeper, deeper hierarchies are for us. So and there are some groups of work this. So, um, one question that, that you might ask is, well, what's inside each of those, those areas? Uh, one of the interesting, another interesting lesson we take from neuroscience is this idea that cortex is cortex is cortex. So, this is uh, an image, an MRI image of the brain. And if we sort of zoomed in on uh, Cortical layers. So basically, the cortex is like a crumpled up piece of paper. And you know, we took a piece of paper and looked at it. Um, you know, we cut a cross section of it, 
we see that Cortex is organized into a series of layers. Uh, so these are quarter layers, so layer one through layer six. An interesting thing about, about this organization is that it's observed across the entire brain, not just the visual system, not just sensory cortex, but, but everything. So on, on the left there, you have primary sensory cortex, in the middle of the uh, example associated cortex, and you actually have motor cortex. And while the portions of these layers change, the fundamental players that neurons in those layers are the same everywhere. So um, it's hard to tell the difference between primary visual cortex and primary auditory cortex. It's hard to tell the difference between B2 and B4. Um, and what this comment suggests is um, if there's a similar architecture, similar hardware at each of these stages, um, that, that might suggest that this is a, a single operation that's being cascaded. So this is potentially an incredibly powerful idea that if we can figure out what those operations are and cascade them, then that's where we can the game. And if you solve vision, maybe at the same time we're actually solving vision, you're solving some kind of sensation, some sense of touch. So uh, understanding this, um, this idea of neuroscience is going to be really important to figure out these phenomenal operations on time. Now, um, along the way, I just showed you this plot <coughs> of the, the beginning part where we took an image and it was, it was cascaded through. There's this one called RGC here, which stands for retinal ganglion cells. So that's the, the, the photosensitive tissue of the eye. Um, uh, most of the time in computer vision, we just treat that as the image coming in as the camera to a picture. There we are. Uh, an interesting lesson, another interesting lesson we take from neuroscience uh, that's a little bit surprising is that the retina isn't just a camera. Actually, it's quite a bit more than a camera. So if we look uh, at the, the different kinds of cells you find in the retina, uh, it's, it's really interesting. So on the left, those are all different kinds of cell types. Uh, and at the top is photos, uh, photoreceptors. And then there's this whole cast of processing elements. And if you stain them with different uh, bars and dyes, you get a picture in the middle. And then there's a rough circuit background there on the right. So there's a lot of complex processing going on, uh, much more than we usually give credit for in biology and spark vision. And uh, there's a nice review by uh, Marcus Meister and his students in 2009, uh, where they went through a whole bunch of mechanisms that can be done in the retina. So just to label them all. So we do things like texture motion detection, temporal coding of boundaries, uh, the retina's able to detect looming, so as soon as it's closer. Uh, you can actually get uh, transient switching, so on cell, turn it into off cell. So there's this really uh, incredibly powerful repertoire of things that happen in what we call this, we usually treat like sort of dumb fixes. So um, a lot more complexity there, uh, and at the very least license to do more, um, and a lot of these things can normally be sort of in your model cortex, uh, these things can actually be sort of pushed down into, into the retina. And then similarly, if we look at the actual layers, we look at each of those little circles, think of those as, as being neurons, the individual neurons are probably more complex than so a lot of times in, in biotransfer models, including in our own, um, we treat these as sort of dot products. It's just a multiple <coughs> of those, uh, and convolutional neural networks, that's basically what they are. Uh, the reality of the situation is quite a bit more confusing and interesting. So uh, what we have here is uh, that, that white thing in the center of the sort of screen is a neuron. The, the central part of it is the cell body, and then those little sort of filaments coming off the end are what are called dendrites. And if you put uh, stimulating electrodes on either the same branch of the dendrites or on different branches, you get radically different behavior. So on the top, uh, if, you, if you stimulate the same branch in two different places, you get this incredible superlinear response. And then if you stimulate on two different branches, you get uh, exactly the linear response that you expect. So treating these neurons, this isn't mammal, so this isn't uh, anything, I mean, this is the thing where you can model it just a dot product. There's quite a bit more a much richer repertoire of things that can be done in individual neurons than usually with the retina. And then when you get to invertebrates, uh, everything just goes completely crazy. So this is uh, part of the visual system of the locust, and this is just one cell that by itself computes looming, so the locust can tell and kind of hit something uh, just with this one neuron. So it's this enormous neuron, it's got uh, separate dendritic subfields, they're relying on the passive uh, uh, conduction properties of the dendrites, they're relying on active conductance. But this is like a computer unto itself, this one single neuron. Now, thankfully, in, in mammals, it seems like these kinds of big computations are broken into many neurons, but uh, there's quite a bit more we can do with individual neurons than we typically do. So that's uh, wraps up that sort of sub theme. So things are more complex. Um, there's many more ways that they're more complex, but this is just a, gives you a, a flavor of that, a way that we can look to neuroscience to look more complicated. Um, the next area that I wanted to to talk about is the secret life of neuroscience data. So if you're 
speaker of this workshop, and particularly for presenting this workshop, I'm presuming that you're reading neuroscience papers. To get biological inspiration, you're, you want to read about biology. Um, a lot of biological inspiration is for second hand as well, and that's fine. But um, if, you, if you are reading neuroscience data, uh, there, there, are, there are sort of dragons. Uh, there are dragons there. So uh, what I want to talk about here is just four quick points um, that can help you, or at least alert you to where, where the dangers are. So the first is that, is that real neuroscience data is really, really noisy. Uh, so I don't know if you can hear this, um, but this is an actual experiment. If you ever wondered where the data, what the data looks like from a real neuroscience experiment, this is uh, a neuron in rat visual cortex. This was just recorded a couple of weeks ago. Um, so the actual signals themselves are these discrete events called spike attraction potentials. And there's a couple ways in which this is really noisy. So if you could hear this, you might notice it's sort of got like a little bit of a popcorn sort of stuff. Uh, popcorn sort of sound to it, so it's got kind of a maximum statistics to it to the environment. So spikes are, roughly speaking, a song distributed. So they're just about as noisy as they possibly could be. So uh, any given trial, if you have a spike rate of about 10 spikes per second, you, in, a, in a given 100 dozen of you may or may not have a spike. So um, the data is incredibly noisy, which means that most of, the, most of the experiments, most of the results that you see actually are average of many trials. The second way in which this is really, really noisy is there's no Canonical way of defining what one cell is. So here, this is a really big spike, but uh, so it's relatively ambiguous. But there could be two cells next to the electrode, um, and in that case, it's really it's, it's really no sort of standardized way to define part. And each lab sort of does its own thing with, with defining what uh, what one spike is. So the consequences of this is uh, when you read neuroscience papers, you really should be aware of the template process data. The data is really noisy, and the more steps that are Results you're reading, um, you should just, just be on the guard. Um, the other thing is that setting the trial to trial phenomenon is really hard because you have to average over many trials. And so experience and, and adaptation effects can be in end up with the situation where, um, where the, the results might come down. The other fundamental problem is so the way these data are collected is you have an electrode that's being geared into the brain, and then when the electrode gets close to the cell, you're able to detect the electrical activity of the action connections. Um, there's a fundamental problem though that you basically are driving lines. You're driving the into the brain, and you're listening for, for neurons to spike. But if, so it's sort of like a game of Marco Polo. You don't know the neurons there, and you can be right next to this neuron that doesn't look very interesting, but it isn't spiking, you don't know it's there. So um, this leads to interesting consequences um, where um, you might, if you don't show the right stimulus, you may not even know the cells there. So there's a tendency to sample um, only the cells that basically you built into your experiment. Um, and then the other problem is the measuring population properties. So uh, it become popular to measure things like selectivity or sparseness, uh, so making infection and passive sensing and things are happening in the vision. It's very hard to actually measure in real neurons because um, it's hard to know if there's really selective cell there if you're not showing the signals that it actually responds to. So, so this is another sort of danger of being able to see The other problem that we have too that you should be aware of in read neuroscience papers. So IG cortex is this sort of final visual stage of processing, but there's actually relatively little agreement on, on, on what IG cortex is. So depending on which, which particular experiment, which lab, which country the lab is in, you'll find variation in what that actually means. So uh, I did my PhD uh, in Cambridge, and in Cambridge, uh, you know, IG cortex means around the interior of the Jarvis. But if you were in the UK, uh, in the Paris lab, it might be the ventral magnetic sphere to result. So this is a completely different non-overlapping brain brain. Uh, and then, uh, so, um, if you're reading neuroscience you know, papers for inspiration, uh, just be on guard that the same name oftentimes applies in many different ways. And these are things that we need to sort of be aware of. So, the other thing uh, that you might have noticed in neuroscience know, papers is the sort of idea of a representative neuron. Uh, and I, 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 I'm not sure other people's papers here, so these are all, these are all my papers. So I'm sort of nervous about throwing stones uh, at people. So, so, this is a representative, uh, two representative cells from. And they have nice and crisp responses and, and six spikes per second. So, like, oh, every, every cell must be nicely tuned uh, to these things. Uh, the fact of the matter is, these are almost always representative of the hypothesis, not representative of the actual population. So, here's another example of one of my papers uh, where on uh, the left, I'm showing the response properties. The details of these aren't really important, but the bottom line is we were trying to show that, the, that in the top condition, there was uh, variation in responses to different signals which were put in different 
colors, and the bottom there isn't much of a difference there. Uh, this neuron here, which is the representative neuron, is actually this one up here. It's huge. So it's sort of the most extreme relative to, to what we were, it's, it's the best example of what we were trying to do. And everyone in neuroscience knows that this is how it's this because we're all doing it, um, that people coming from computer vision um, shouldn't have a, a, a false sense that everything is sort of clean. It really is messy. And whenever there's a scatter plot like the one on the left, that's where the point should be looking at because that's where the point is. That's really good. So just moving along. Uh, this is sort of final point for how to interpret neuroscience literature is most neuroscience experiments deal with small amounts of data, small amounts of incredibly hard work data. So the, the calculus of doing a neuroscience experiment is basically this. Um, so I showed that electrode next to the cell. Uh, you actually only have about 20 minutes to an hour to interact with that cell to measure its responses. So this is sort of, it's never written in the method sections of papers because everybody knows it, but it's basically it, true. The cell basically can die, it's been skewered by the electrode, or it'll sort of go away and we'll get access to it. So 20 minutes to an hour with the data. The data was noisy, as I showed you, so we need 6 to 20 repetitions to prove an RNA, you know, which is usually the sort of quantum of, of experimental data. And then when you're presenting stimuli to the animal, uh, we presented a maximum rate of maybe 5 hertz, but, but 1 per second is not common. So when you're reading a neuroscience experiment uh, about vision, uh, that all works out to maybe a few hundred stimuli are possible in the experiment. So any given neurons, they can only get, or we can only get, a couple hundred. <laughs> So if you're coming with computer vision, imagine somebody told you, oh, we built this great model, and then we tested it on 100 images. That would be sort of, that'd be sort of scandalous, right? That, that's not good enough. Um, so you, you should be defensive in, in your sort of reading of what neuroscience literature you have to understand that this is a limitation that's, that's hard to overcome. And in particular, uh, on one hand, this sort of provides the thrown emission of the data, and suppress the complexity that's going to be natural in these data sets. Um, there's a strong tendency to make particular stimulus set choices to improve the outcome. So if you don't have thousands of images, it's hard to get a really representative example. And then the final point, which, which is I think really important, is the idea that fitting complex models to neural data. So it's common to say, okay, I have this great model of biological vision, it does well on these daily tasks, like one on one, or this and this model. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to fit that to neural data and prove that it's just like the neurons. Um, the problem with that is, I only had 100 stimuli, I only had 20 minutes worth of data. Um, if my model has you know, maybe 10 or 30 parameters, again, I'm not, I'm, I, can, I can show you papers, but I don't want to throw stones. Um, if, if I have a sufficiently complex model, I can fit almost any data with a model that has 10 or 30 parameters. So it's um, very tricky to be very skeptical of people telling you that they built a computational model that explains neural data, because the neural data makes much of sense. It's really hard to do. Okay, so, so that's a little And then I want to finish up with a uh, sort of idea that biology, biology and computer vision scale and generalize is very different. So again, these are neuroscience and psychology things that tell us that we may or may not be going in the right direction with biology and smart vision. Uh, and particularly the first one I want to point to is the idea that computation scales differently for brains and So if you look at these images, uh, can everyone identify who these people are?
have more high-res data, uh, humans are actually faster at doing whatever face recognition task we need to do, and they're slower at the low resolution. So this is a complete inversion. One of the sure signs that you have a wrong algorithm is if its computation complexity doesn't scale correctly. Um, so, so this is this is sort of a, a hint that, that maybe we're, we're doing something wrong. And this is and, and that sort of computational scaling is true even involves the micro uh, producers. Um, and then the other the other side of this as well is if you look at a lot of particularly face recognition uh, algorithms like uh, LVP low binary patterns are, are very popular right now. They're predominantly using high resolution information. So if you were to high pass filter in a niche, uh, the LVPs can work more or less just as well. Um, in contrast, if you look at these two images, humans are, are terrible at, at when with only high resolution information is preserved. So can I anyone identify the person on the left and the person on the right? Kevin Costner on the right, and we got the guy on the left. It's Jim Carrey. So, um, so if, uh, if you were to apply LVP to this, LVP has no problem telling you that's Jim Carrey. Um, but something's sort of deeply, deeply wrong with that if, if, if the model is meant to be biologically inspired. So these are properties that we probably should. And then finally, the, the last point that I wanted to make about biological uh, vision is this idea that uh, there's one representation to the all. So uh, in computer vision, it's very common to fall into this sort of mode of thinking that, that object recognition is, 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 the, is the thing. Um, and, uh, and in terms of biological systems, that, that's really not the game is at all. So if we look at this object here, do um, people identify what that is? Anyone have a classifier for that? Um, so, so traditionally, so even biological bio bio computer vision falls into the same same sort of mode as the rest of the computer vision. Where you know, you, you, maybe you build feature descriptors and then you train up a bunch of SVNs and you do sort of one versus all classification on, on a whole bunch of these things, and you identify what they are. Um, but if you look at actually the, the task requirements <laughs> of a real organism, at the end of the day, um, uh, it's acceptable. Vision scientists, we don't, you know, our, our figure of merit is not how well we do a classification, our figure of merit is how well we survive, like food, eat, uh, maybe in computer vision, those two things are related, um, but um, for computer vision scientists. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's really a sort of a pale shadow, the, the sort of standard one versus all, or anime classification problem is really a pale shadow of what we really do with the life. This is apparently a steampunk ring. Um, at, the, at, at the end of the day, um, whether or not you can give it a name, uh, this is wealth of information you can extract. If you know that you can put it on your finger, if you can do this, if you have this from scale reference, you know you can put it on your finger on your hand, you can tell me that there's a string on there, you can tell me that there's metal there, you could um, show me how you adjust your grip if you wanted to pick it up. Uh, similarly, um, there's lots of things like maybe you can imagine having a rock detector, a uh, rock classifier, but, um, but much more than that, you can extract that there's a hole in that object. Uh, if we wanted to hug it, we would move it like that. It's made of uh, stones, or maybe it's cool to touch. Uh, this is really, there's a sense in which a lot of things that biologists have to do. And then uh, if you look more broadly at the sort of full monopoly of different organisms in the world, uh, there are things like navigation, which are very difficult to phrase in terms of object recognition, um, but are really critical in animal survival. So rats, uh, every time they go out, they navigate around their environment to avoid their food. These are some of the efficient tasks, um, and that's the kind of thing that actually drives evolution. And uh, just uh, one, one note on this issue, uh, we recently submitted a paper on uh, inspired representation, and uh, this, was a, this was a response we got, as uh, so was a face recognition paper, and that we heard about. But I failed to see it, this is a major disappointment in this paper, is how the proposed representation is in any way peculiar to face processing. In fact, in the paper, the proposed representation will be applied to any of the so um, there's a strong bias in computer vision that, well, you're doing face recognition. Where is the face recognition? Um, and the fact of the matter is, biology is adapted to do not just face recognition, but face recognition, navigation, object recognition, a whole variety of, of tasks. So if we're going to sort of figure out how we build our institutions and do all these things, we need to get past this. And this applies to individual task sets as well. So there's a, there's a nice paper here in the PR this past week 
Uh, this this hierarchy picture also is, is, is sort of naive. So this is actually, if you really map all connections from area to area, here they are. So, uh, so this is the retina, this is LGN, and then this is V1, V2, V3, V4, and then the connections up there. Um, so you can see that pretty much everything is connected to everything else. So, um, so, so there, there's, a, there's a sort of shallow form of biological inspiration where you just say, like, well, some, I read the neuroscience paper once that there's a deeper hierarchy and I built up the model. And then there's a deeper version where you can go a little deeper and find out, well, actually, what happens is there's this really rich set of dense interconnections. And neuroscience don't work before. And you can use it to wrap them and figure out the cost of it. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. In general, the, the chronological flow is correct, right? So later papers tend to be more correct than later papers to first approximation. Um, coming, so, so given the logic of like, if they, you know, I get the literature view over in the neuroscience and I get the literature view over in the peer um, it's very strange for me. Uh, it's a very different uh, ethos. Um, and I'm not sure why there's a few more, I think, that you know, you're just kind of in a terms.
there exist reviews like that. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, you, no one's saying that, I mean, no one's proposing that you sort of take the entire neuroscience literature on hold and then sort of distill it down into a model. Uh, it's more that if you have intuitions about how uh, the human thing, the original task can solve, and you can go focus way in the neuroscience literature and look for inspiration. The fact of the matter is, most 
So there are a lot of techniques, they're constantly being developed, and then old te techniques are constantly being refined. So I think this is really a growth stage for neuroscience. And, and at some level, um, the more strength that can come in from business like computational um, vision, um, the, the more of those sort of tools can be applied in useful ways. But yeah, it's definitely there's no, no, no stall. So I'd just also like to direct you to um, so some of the actual computer vision work we're doing uh, at Saxon. 